streaming live via the Internet, welcome to ISP Radio, your weekly source for ISP-related news, events, and interviews with industry experts. If you deliver Internet via fiber optic, wireless, coax, or any other way, you're in the right place. Chat live with us weekly via ISPRadio.com every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Central Time. And now a brief word from our sponsors. Link Technology, providing ISP consulting, support, and hardware for wireless ISPs. TowerCoverage.com, providing online RF coverage maps. Mimosa Networks, providing high-density, high-bandwidth radio products. Advanced LLC, providing retail and wholesale advanced communication services by matching providers with your bandwidth needs. And by Cytel, providing reliability in search suppression. And now your host for ISP Radio, Steve Grabiel and Dennis Burgett. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to ISP Radio. I hope everybody had a great Memorial Weekend. Uh, if you are listening from the U.S., you know that we've had a, uh, a good Memorial Day weekend. We had a Lots of iffy rain and storms here in St. Louis. Uh, basically on Friday, the weatherman said, it's going to rain all weekend. Uh, so a lot of people didn't plan any outdoor activities or get-togethers. And then Saturday, it was beautiful. And then Sunday, guess what? It was beautiful besides a couple of rain and showers you know, right before dark. And then Monday, Memorial Day, beautiful again, figures. So uh, it, it does happen. So today we're going to be talking uh, about BGP, and uh, we have uh, uh, Faisal. Are you with us? Yes, Dennis. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Gotcha. This he is, is my... with uh, Snappy. Was it was a Snappy DSL. Snappy Internet and Telecom out of Miami. There you go. See, he has all the right words. How's the weather in Miami? Oh, it's been uh, it's been gorgeous. Uh, it's it's been very very warm, and uh, we had a we had a great uh, Memorial Day weekend. It was very 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 nice, uh, very bright and sunny. And uh, I, I want to give uh, my I want to give a shout out to to all, all, all our friends in Houston and Dallas. Hope they're safe and uh, they're dealing with uh, with some uh, with some more challenging weather related weather weather anomalies than some the rest of us. Yes, yes. I actually seen a post on, uh, I don't remember which list it was. Uh, I think it was one of the WISPA lists. Uh, actually, one of uh, our customers, he sent a, uh, a picture out, uh, 80 a mile an hour, uh, straight line winds, uh, and basically 90 feet uh, of broken telephone masts and electric poles, and then uh, the, the mast where our micropop is at, and of course, just folded right over right at the, uh, looks like it's a Roan 25, but it was folded over right at the uh, house mounting point, the uh, the wall bracket. So, obviously, weather is always a factor for all of us. But this kind of leads us into our question, uh, a topic today, which is BGP. You know, if you have uh, a good redundancy, and, and obviously you can't fix the tower that's been folded over or the tower that's collapsed, but uh, how can you fix getting and keeping your customers online that are not directly impacted by such a uh, such an event and i'm sure you uh, down in miami you know you guys get these uh, wonderful things called hurricanes um, i'm glad i'm not anywhere near that <laughs> if you know what i mean uh, <laughs> uh, you know it's actually a true story i'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell my dad here my my father uh, has been getting ready to retire, and he, he said that we're going to move, me and your mom is going to move someplace where it's warm, there's no snow, and near water. And I'm like, so you're going to be a re typical retiree and move to Florida. And he goes, well, you know, we've been looking at that. And I go, you know what's going to happen? You know, he, he's never been, you know, in a, in a tornado, never been in a hurricane. The first hurricane is going to go through, and he's going to be knocking on my door two days later going, we're moving in your basement until we can sell the house in Florida. I, 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 I know that's what's going to happen. He's going to say, he's going to basically say, nope, screw that. I ain't doing it. Out of here. And, and that's it. So uh, I actually watched a, a show, not to say anything bad about Florida, but it was about uh, the number of sinkholes Florida has. And, uh, yeah, in central Florida, that that's, that's appears to be a very commonly occurring event. Gotcha. Yeah, and Miami's not too terribly bad, except uh, I think you guys have surpassed the, the Chicago as far as the worst driving and construction possible. 
after the last show down that. there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we we tried to we tried to take a uh, to drive like two miles down Miami Beach or something like that, and pfft, it was like an hour later. So anyway, so back to BGP. Where do we want to start? You have a good 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 starting point. Well, uh, you know, maybe an introduction to what BGP is. <clears throat> there you go. It is. It is. It is the core protocol running on all the internet backbone routers. It is the core protocol that is used to exchange all the routing information, and it is probably, it may be even fair to say that, you know, BGP is what runs the internet. I I would say that's a fair question. I mean, as far as global internet goes, Everybody talks BGP, and as you grow in your business, what you're going to find is uh, eventually you have to have survivability in the event of a router failure, in the event of a circuit failure, in the event of uh, the the per se, you know, a, a tornado came through and took out one of my pop sites. And whenever we look inside your network, so we look at your wireless network or your fixed uh, fiber network. It doesn't matter what network it is. In many cases, what you'll see is in certain geographic areas, we usually see IGPs or interior routing protocols, uh, something similar to OSPF, uh, et cetera, that handles most of your internal routing. But whenever we start talking to external networks, so we're joining, let's say, your South Miami network to your North Florida network. Those are two separate networks. They technically operate uh, diversely and independently of each other. That's a good example of using BGP to join those two uh, examples. Uh, you guys have a Internet exchange in Miami, correct? That is correct. Okay. Multiple exchanges. Gotcha. So... Let me kind of give you an ideal, or or at least our listeners, what an exchange is so that you understand where BGP and how BGP works. Whenever you you create a BGP session, you're creating a peer, and that peer is basically your router or your device talking to uh, somebody else's. And obviously both parties have to agree on, on various factors, but once you guys both agree on that, you guys peer together. You create a BGP session. And what happens is, is I sit there and tell you, uh, or I'm sorry, I tell, tell the, the other peer, the remote partner, here is the IP networks that I'm responsible for. I know how to get to these networks. And guess what? Your other provider, whoever this other uh, customer is or this peering partner is, will tell you about their networks. Now, when we look at BGP and the Internet access, we have uh, basically the local table, which is the table that would be only for you, and then we have what we call transit tables, which would be something like a full Internet table. In other words, I'm telling you I know how to get to every part of the Internet. Whenever we go into what's called peering exchanges, which are usually mutually beneficial, typically very low-cost exchanges, switching systems, that allow many peers to directly connect to each other on a common shared platform. What's really nice about those is that most of them will simply offer uh, one connection to the exchange. Once you get on the exchange, now you can go to anybody else that's on it and say, hey, I would like to peer with you. And as long as they deem it mutually beneficial, they typically will. Not all the time, but most of the time. A good example of this I'm going to use is uh, another peering exchange. I'm not going to say where it's at uh, because it's one of our customers. But uh, they had a 500 meg fiber circuit from a local provider, and that was their only Internet connection. Now, they had a number of uh, issues with that circuit going down in the past, say, six months. Now, this was nothing that they could control. Typically, it was what we like to call backhoe fade, uh, drunk driver fade. Basically, either the telephone poles or backhoe, something was was dug up, and it was all fiber. And it does happen. So what they did is they ran another fiber circuit to the local peering exchange. Now, when they went to this peering exchange, this, this exchange has all of the major content providers that you can think of on it. Netflix, Google, uh, Hulu, uh, Amazon's on it, Microsoft is on it, Apple is on it, uh, and those are just some of, some of them. 
But the example here is that immediately we decide, hey, let's see how many we can how many we can peer with. So we started peering with these guys, and within about four or five days, getting these massive uh, these good peers up. We had changed the traffic from maxing out that 500 meg fiber connection to bringing in 400 plus meg over the uh, peering exchange. So just think, every time you go to uh, Netflix and every time you go to Hulu, etc., on this particular network or on your network, now instead of you going out this expensive internet connection, you're just going to this peering exchange and taking that traffic directly to their network. So you're not going through an intermediary, i.e. best path routing. Now, once we did this, we actually found we had another problem because they were hitting their 500 meg uh, limit on their internet circuit. Uh, they actually ended up going, well, we, we have this issue is that now the peering exchange is bringing in 410 to 430 meg peak time, but our bandwidth to the internet is still at 300 meg. So that tells you how much more bandwidth that they were moving now that they were on the peering exchange and customers had better connectivity. Uh, what, what You said you, you have several peering exchanges. Are you on all those down there? And absolutely. Absolutely, Dennis. And, and if I, if, you know, for, for, for a lot of people, some, you know, I, I like to explain things with analogies. So, so sometimes analogies are a little bit easier and simpler for non-technical people to understand. So if if I may if I may indulge a little bit and give an analogy of okay. how the BGP and the peering exchange affects uh, your traffic, I'll, I'll I'll give an analogy of a post office. Let's say let's say each ISP service provider is basically mailing a lot of packets with packages or packets to different people on behalf of their customers. So they have a choice. They can take it to the post office and they can say, hey, Mr. Mr. Postman, here is, here is, you know, 500 packages I have for you. Go deliver them to wherever they go. Now, the post office can decide. This is, they, they can say, okay, this package goes down the street, so we'll just put it in a, in a, in a truck and it will go down the street. But this other package is going to go to the next town, but we have to send it to our main sorting hub, which is going to take an extra day, and they're going to figure out, and then they're going to send the package over to the next town, which may be a much longer path, and the package is a little bit more delayed in, in getting there. So this is, this is how a typical IP transit with a carrier, uh, with, with a carrier works. We deliver a, a, a service provider would basically hand off all their traffic or packets to their upstream IP transit provider, and then the IP transit provider makes the sole decision on how to move that traffic or those packages to their endpoints. So you, as, as somebody who's handing off those, those, that, 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 those packages, don't get a say in how it's done. Sometimes those packages will take a longer way to get, uh, get to their destination, which is less efficient. Now, just imagine what if you, in, in the same scenario, what a peering exchange does is, is saying, let's say uh, now you're, you're peering with somebody like Netflix or Microsoft or Google, and you know there's a lot of traffic going to these guys or coming from them to you. Essentially what you do is you basically you're sorting out the packages and saying instead of me giving it to the post office and then the post office taking whichever way they want to get the package across, I will just give it, I'll just drop it right off to Netflix, or I'll just drop it right off to Microsoft, and vice versa. If, if, if Netflix has to send something to you, which is a stream or a package coming back, they just bring it to your router directly. So at the end of the day, what, what it does is it creates a much more efficient service in terms of routing, and it also gives you a much better control. And it also gives you uh, it also gives you a much better load balancing. In other words, you're not overwhelming your one connection or one truck or one pipeline going to the post office. In this example, to your IP transit provider, you can say, "Hey, all these packages they don't have to clog up my connection." So it, overall, it's just it, it has 
it, it, it has many, many benefits, and, and it, is, it, is, it is the way to go as you grow your network, you improve your connectivity, and you also have to load balance. Excellent. That's actually a really good analogy in those particular cases. It's, it's like instead of you having, as you said, the, the 18 wheelers going from your office to the post office to get all your packages out, you know you deal with a lot of traffic, a lot of packages between you and one other company. So you just hire a little uh, a little shuttle bus to go back and forth between those two just to move those packets because that's how many you move. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. Just just more efficient. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Right. And especially in, in, in today's um in in, 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 in in reality what it is is in today's internet most of our uh, customers are pulling content from uh, a small group of uh, content providers. So these are these are what I call high high traffic content providers. Uh, essentially, I, I think I think it, if 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 we were to sit down and 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 and, and analyze it, probably uh, a good sixty percent of Internet traffic on an average residential service provider can is is probably going to somewhere about ten to fifteen uh, content providers. Which uh, and, and I and, I could probably and, toss out a couple those, of those. I mean, we got Netflix and Hulu, and Google. Those are are three right there. Facebook. Um, Twitter is probably not as much, but it's important. Uh, and then you have the big downloaders. So you have uh, Alchemy, which hosts you know millions of probably websites. Uh, Amazon, which has tons of servers. Uh, and then you get into Microsoft and Apple being, uh, again, updates, downloads, things like that. I mean, those are probably... I'm sure there's there's several more big ones, but those are probably your your the big ones that I would say that your sixty plus percent of traffic probably come from. Would that be correct? Right? correct. Do, do you know any, and, of any and, other and, ones? Yeah, and 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 to me, and for me, the most uh, surprising one was actually Facebook. I I and and it it only occurred to me after I was looking at traffic. Um, one would think that. Facebook traffic is not shouldn't be shouldn't be a whole lot, but uh, because of those auto playing videos on Facebook, uh, the traffic to and from you know from Facebook is fairly significant, or can be fairly significant. Yeah, I think I I read in uh, I believe it was in 2014, Facebook drove a quarter of the web traffic. So if you use Facebook, there's 25 percent. You have another 30 plus percent with Netflix. You know that that's Absolutely. over half of your internet traffic right there. Absolutely, and Akamai, you know, Akamai is a CDN, so that they they play, they play a huge role as well. So, but at the end of the day, if you're if you're if you can connect to a peering fabric, which is typically at a much much reduced cost in IP transit, because you're simply paying for the port. And you have uh, you have you know uh, these these dozen uh, top top uh, these dozen top guys available. It's 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 well worth it. It's 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 it's, it's a it's much better improved service and um, it, it also reduces cost. So it's it's an immediate R, uh, it's an immediate ROI on 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 the connection. Yeah, I'm going to just give everybody an example. Uh, do not think that this is the uh, end-all pricing, but I'm just going to give you an example of, of an Internet exchange I know of. Um, in the area that they're in, a, a gig uh, transit circuit from the local provider would be anywhere between, uh, say, 800 to 1500 a month. And, and that's a good transit provider, and that's a good price, uh, depending on how far you're out. Uh, on the flip side of that, the internet exchange just getting the port you still have to get to to that site so in other words it's not like they are are saying hey it's it's free or it's basically inexpensive um 
it is very inexpensive, but that same gig speed to the peering exchange, that port is only $100. So you're looking at usually around 10% or, or even less sometimes uh, of what a internet transit circuit will cost you to get on one of those peering exchanges. The thing, though, is that you still have transit costs to get to the peering exchange. If you're already in a data center that supports one, that's even better. Um, but the goal here is as you start in uh, uh, start building your network, everybody says, oh, I, I, I got this great upstream. They've been really great people, et cetera, you know, and, and they provide me really great Internet. Well, they they are doing the same thing. If you took what they are doing and you brought it directly to your network just think how much better your network would even be on top of it so maybe we ought to talk about uh you know what is the path so right now let's say we have a a isp that is getting a uh, 100 or 500 meg or a gigabit speeds from an upstream provider one upstream what is the path of going BGP to add BGP to their circuit and the path so that again this past weekend on Memorial Day weekend if you have one circuit that goes down hey guess what it's not a big deal you can you can wait until Tuesday to actually work on it you don't even have to work on it on a holiday weekend so you want to explain what that that process would be Absolutely, Dennis, and 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 that is that is what I call the 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 the, uh, the benefit of being able to sleep well at night and and deal with issues. Uh, real, reality reality of, of of life is that a failures never happen in singular events. Um, that's that's one of Murphy's laws. That failures will always be cascade failures. Uh, essentially, uh, what that means is when something goes wrong, it is never just one thing. It's a series of things that goes wrong. Uh, the, 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 second part of, you know, the second part of this is that uh, it is always good to have lots of options on how to mitigate or work around failures. So b having BGP transit uh, with multiple – having – IP transit with multiple carriers that you're doing BGP gives you lots of options. Uh, essentially, uh, depending upon your network design, you could do it, you, you could justify it based on offloading, offloading traffic, or the primary reason is provide redundancy. In, 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 when you're running BGP, you can actually control how traffic is is getting influenced uh, in terms of incoming and outgoing via one provider or the ra or the second provider. It is um, for us, uh, for example, we appeared with multiple uh, IP transit providers and multiple peering fabrics. So we're able to mitigate. We're able to see. Says, let's say if uh, level three and. Hurricane Electric is having an issue in Kansas, for example, and, and it's affecting a customer of ours in Atlanta. Uh, we're able to uh, do a little bit of uh, digging and look into it and say which alternate paths are available and use the BGP parameters to move around that traffic, uh, move around that trouble spot. Or uh, if, you, if you find that one service provider is just having a very difficult time or they have some sort of an outage, essentially you can shut that provider down temporarily and shift traffic over to the other other provider and basically, you know, uh, go to sleep and then give them enough time to deal with their issue. Um, so this is so every little hiccup that somebody else has on their network network does not become an end all uh, pain point for you and your customers. I mean, that's 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 uh, that's the true benefit at the end of the day. Having that redundancy, as you say, having that sleep factor, is is always very 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 important. Totally uh, totally understand that. So going down uh, real quick here before we go any further, for anybody that has any questions that are listening in, make sure you hit our uh, chat button. Feel free to ask any questions. Uh, we are uh, on there, so please feel free to ask if you have any questions. 
Um, going back to, to how do you get started? So, so you've, you've got your internet connection. The very first thing, at least in the Aaron region, so North American region, uh, would be go to Aaron and get your AS number, autonomous system number. Every BGP peer, whenever you create those, you have to have some type of autonomous system number. Um, there are private ones that some companies use, but typically um, if you are going to multi-home, in other words, get onto a peering fabric or getting into a peering exchange or just having multiple providers, you immediately qualify to get an AS. So go ahead and get one of those. The next step is how can you, uh, you know, we've been talking about inbound, uh, or I'm sorry, outbound pathing. You know, if you go to Microsoft.com and you have a direct peer with Microsoft.com, then there's, there shouldn't be any middlemen. You go directly there. And, and just like if you're buying wholesale, uh, you know, if you're buying uh, parts from a vendor and now you, you buy enough quantity that, hey, you want to go directly to the manufacturer, it's kind of the same ideal. That's another good uh, another analogy is that now you're going straight to the vendor, in this case straight to uh, the person who's generating that content. So... The first thing is get your AS number. On the flip side of that is we have inbound pathing redundancy. So not only do you have the ability to, to determine which path outbound is the best, but you also have abilities to influence uh, inbound pathing. You know, hey, I need to go this direction, or hey, I need to go this direction uh, as far as inbound data. So let's say you do have a, a large network that spans, I'm just going to pick on Florida here again, but you, you, you have a network that expands most of Florida. You don't want traffic to come in down in South Florida if you have a connection up in North Florida for the North Florida tra uh, customers. So that would be an example of, hey, I want to make sure my North Florida customers get traffic inbound on its nearest peering point instead of coming all the way back down to Miami and then back out. Now, there may be advantages and disadvantages to doing that, but that's an option that you have as the network operator. And then, of course, let's say that north uh, internet connection, that north transit provider goes down, of course you can still feed your north customers or northern Florida customers with that connection from Miami. So again, you get that inbound path redundancy. The last one that I'll definitely mention here, uh, or the two two more is, with BGP, you're announcing IP addresses. So you're telling your neighbors, your peers, what IP addresses you know about. Now, this is different than a standard internet connection with no BGP because if you have a failure of uh, that circuit, typically any IP addresses associated with that circuit are basically off the internet. It doesn't reroute, okay, because you're only announcing or that provider is announcing out to the internet, but since you don't have a second connection with that provider, you are not telling that provider how to get to those IP addresses. So again, this kind of goes back to that redundancy. By you having BGP with multiple peers, you do get that redundancy, you do get the full-blown internet connection in internet experience. Maybe latency is a little higher, maybe the internet's slower because of a slow connection, but the big thing is it works. And I always tell everybody this. Having slow internet is better than no internet. And I have had customers call us up and say, hey, your internet's running slow. Yes, yes, we know. We have a, a fiber break. We're running on a backup circuit. It's currently overloaded. We are uh, going to be working on upgrading the, the backup circuit once we get the main circuit up and running. Uh, but you should still get your internet. And as long as they're not doing uh, video conferencing or, or what we call interactive applications, you know, they can still do their Netflix. They can still do uh, a number of items that latency isn't a big deal. So you get that peace of mind is that you can get that done. And most customers will sit there and say, oh, well, you know, I just, I, I just want to tell you that it's running slow, but thanks for letting me know what's going on. And they're totally fine with it. They're very, very happy to simply know, hey, they're working on it, but it's not off. As soon as it's off, they call it, I can't get to the dang internet. They start cussing you out and everything else because nothing works. So I always sit there and say slow is, is better than off. The last part is failover and balancing, uh, in load balancing. Uh, I have seen some BGP configurations that we basically say I have a 100 meg circuit and I have a 10 meg circuit. And I want the majority of my traffic to come in through the 100 meg circuit but if the 100 meg circuit's down, then I want to fail to the 10 meg. And while you can mostly get this to, to work, 
um, depending on on the the networks that you connect to. Um, you can definitely get the the majority of that to work. But the bigger part is instead of you upgrading uh, from uh, a one gig or I'm sorry a half a gig circuit to a full gig circuit, maybe you find a second half gig circuit, and now you have the redundancy two multiple uh, paths that are geographically dispersed, hopefully even better, um, that the chances of both paths going completely out at the same time is, is very, very, very slim. And that gives you that redundancy again and allows you for balancing. So you can get in uh, several hundred meg from one provider and several hundred meg from the other provider and not have to worry again about the, the individual failures. Slow is still better than off. I will tell everybody that if the budget allows for it let's say you do have a, a two internet circuits let's say your peak traffic is 650 meg that means both your circuits probably need to be 700 plus meg that way if you do have a failure of one or the other circuit guess what either circuit can carry the complete load however nor under normal operations both circuits would be fairly lightly loaded so that you have additional capacity I do see this quite a bit where, hey, I have a, a 500 meg and I, I purchased this 10 meg circuit just for redundancy. The, the, the balance is so far off that that 10 meg circuit is not going to do much. Slow isn't the word. It, it most likely will be unusable because it's such less bandwidth. So you always want to have enough bandwidth to support your entire customers. And whenever you get into the peering exchanges and you get into many connections, that's whenever, you know, one failure, you just turn that circuit off, let them fix your problem or their problem, you know, let them go out and fix the fiber, whatever the case is. You turn it off, you wait for them to fix it. Once it's fixed, then you can test it again, verify the problem's not there anymore, and then there you go. Now you're on about your business. Absolutely, Dennis. And, and uh, I want to add a couple more things to uh, BGP. So I, I want to I want to call this this is common misconceptions about BGP. There we go. Um, what, one one you know in in, in my experience, um, uh, there are some some very common misconceptions, and let's see if I can try to list them. Uh, the first. The, the first misconception is, um, well, it's actually a more of a question. It says, you need to have at least a slash 24, which is a Class C IP address, to be able to advertise via BGP, via external BGP. Internal BGP, since that's on your network, it's a, you can do whatever you want. The second misconception is, if I have IP address space that is assigned to me from my upstream, can I use it, can I advertise that via another upstream? And the answer is absolutely yes, with the appropriate uh, authorization that that, I, that slash 24 or IP subnet, whatever, but IP, IPs which are assigned to you from service provider A can be used to advertise uh, via your BGP session to service provider B, so that that that's 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 um, you know that's uh, you don't you don't necessarily have to have your own Iron assigned IP space, which is nice. But if you don't have it, you can always um, advertise um, upstream provided IP address space as well. The other, the other, quite, the other thing that I want to add uh, to Dennis's example is um, uh, to, to Dennis's kind of what Dennis said earlier. Uh, essentially, yes, you do want to think in terms of redundancy. And I'll share with you many years ago, uh, cost when we started out and looking for the redundancy, cost is always a major, major factor in terms of budget, and it says, hey, can we afford to pay for two connections? So what we actually started doing was we went to some of our peers, some of our local peers, and saying, hey, you have a connection with IP for IP Transit at provider A. We have a connection with IP Transit provider B. You need a backup. We need a backup. How about we agree to do backup for each other at zero cost? Uh, and, and, and that's how we started hearing as well with some of our peers and that's how we in many cases we gained redundancy and better paths by doing that 
Exactly, exactly. And I'll toss out this other thing. As you said, the, the slash 20, 24 requirement is kind of uh, an interesting one. Um, in general, not all the time, but in general, most providers want you to have slash 24s. Most of the time, they're going to filter out things that are smaller. However, I will use a very specific example of one of my customers who has uh, about 20 connections around their network to one upstream, one, one, up, uh, uh, one provider that just happens to be in the area. And what they actually worked out or what we actually worked out was is that we actually advertise all the way down to slash 28s to that upstream. Now, it's all one upstream, and then what happens is the upstream aggregates it all to the general Internet, okay? That is probably not a common thing, but it is possible to do depending on special routing circumstances. Uh, but usually slash 24s are definitely a requirement. Another, another kind of uh, common thing that I get is will BGP, or by adding BGP, avoid congestion? First off, BGP is not hey, I have a T1, and I turn on another T1, and somehow, magically, the first T1's full, and it will just start using the second one. I don't know where that myth comes from, but I've had multiple people tell me, oh, I just wanted to, to keep going. That it, it doesn't work that way. You can balance it. You can try to, but what's going to happen is some data is going to come in one circuit. Some data, which could be completely different, is going to come in another circuit. It would be very rare for you to see... Uh, the same connections coming to both circuits. Uh, it all depends on where they're at on the Internet as well. So uh, that's another good one. Um, another one I got is uh, uh, you need a big, huge router with uh, gobs of memory and to spend a lot of money to do BGP. Uh, since I sell the hardware, I guess I'm going to back off on that one and let you answer that one. Well, <laughs> see, those are all relative terms. Uh, big, uh, uh, lots of memory, expensive. Those are all relative terms. Uh, can you do BGP to the full Internet table using a $50 router? The answer is no, you're not being realistic. Um, can you get a device which acts like a... Uh, a can you get a device to do BGP uh, that handles 500 to a gig of traffic for something in the range of uh, uh, $1,500? Uh, that's absolutely yes. There are lots of devices available in that range. Uh, Microtech routers, uh, x86 routers, uh, you can find many in that range that will do really well. Um, some of them are sold by links and some of them are sold by others. So you can pick your most favorite supplier for that. Gotcha, gotcha. So we have a question then on... If we have, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> we'll get it eventually ahead, here. Not a problem. We do have a question online, and, and this uh, it's a pretty small one. Uh, and I'm not going to let you take this one. Uh, the question reads as follows. As a small Internet service provider, what symptoms might you experience if your provider, so I'm assuming their transit provider... Uh, or one of their providers is experiencing some type of BGP problem uh, versus uh, an Internet connection or other problem? It's kind of a, a loaded uh, question. First, <laughs> first of all, I think it's an excellent question. Thank you for asking that. Um, so you're, you're basically asking, says, hey, uh, uh, how do you go about troubleshooting BGP? And uh, or BGP related issues. So uh, I, th I, th I think I think it's important to point out is you have to you you, you have to do a little bit of um, uh, uh, learning and education in terms of uh, getting familiar with what BGP is and 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 what troubleshooting tools you would use. Um, I'll share with you what I use. Um, uh, in, in, in troubleshooting besides being able to look at the stats in the router to see uh, the, the, the basics of the session being up and getting the full routing table. Um, I, I like to use uh, Traceroute uh, as, as, as a tool. I specifically like uh, MTR in, in, in if you're running Linux. 
uh, which not only gives you your hops, but also packet loss and uh, latency. If you're running Windows, I like to use Ping Plotter, which gives you a similar set of information. Now, one has to one has to keep in mind that BGP is an asymmetric protocol, which means that the packets going out may not be taking the same path as the packets coming in. So you, you can use these tools to figure out how the packets are going out from your side, but if you want to see how the packets are coming in, you have to look for the looking glass uh, portals for your service providers. There are some uh, generic ones available as well on the Internet. Uh, you can search for them on the looking glasses. And different service providers offer different looking glasses um, with different capabilities, but in general, they allow you to see what routes their different routers in different parts of the world or different cities in the United States are seeing. Uh, they allow you to do trace routes and pings from them. So this is what you use to match up um, incoming traffic paths. And essentially, you have to put the two of them together to figure out uh, which way packets are going out, which way packets are coming in. Additionally, with BGP, there are uh, some control features. Uh, one of the most common ones that everybody knows is, uh, or more familiar with is the AS, AS length padding. Uh, everybody believes that with AS length padding, you can control to a certain degree uh, the incoming traffic by making a network closer to you or more distance to you. Today we're finding that more and more service providers are using local pref uh, to override those um, AS path lengths. So uh, it's important to know how your how your uh, how your IP how your upstream IP transit provider is is uh, have, can, is doing their traffic engineering. You can ask. A lot of these service, or your up, upstream service providers uh, directly say, hey, how are you doing that? Or you can ask them for the communities list, which is another feature in BGP. It's, it's a tag you can, you can use to manage uh, certain override conditions or certain conditions or, uh, that, that, that allow you to do a better um, uh, traffic management. Excellent, excellent. Um, I guess I'll I'll uh, take that on too, uh, unless you have some more to, to continue on on that topic. No, it's all yours, Dennis. Beautiful, beautiful. So the very first thing I when I read this sentence in, in the question, I'm gonna just read it real quick again. As a small small internet service provider, what are the symptoms you might experience if your provider or their provider is experiencing BGP problems? The very first part. I'd like to point in here is BGP problems in this particular case is, is really kind of, uh, uh, I'm not going to say, I guess I'll use the word as an oxymoron, but BGP in itself, if it, you're having a quote BGP problem, that means either the peers going up and down or the, uh, the routing table is being flooded up and down, up and down, and there's constant routing changes, things like that. Typically, you won't see an actual, quote, BGP problem. What you'll actually see is you'll see uh, either uh, high latency due to a peer that is currently up and is either overloaded or the circuit has some type of issue. We see that quite often where uh, your upstream has six connections or three connections and the website or the VPN you're trying to build is, is a really good example that I've seen. The B VPN you're trying to build has this horrible latency, and the reason is, is that when you're trying to get from point A to point B, in that particular instance, you're going out a peer of your upstream that has, uh, you know, that peer is 100 meg or it's only a gig, and it's maxed out, and you have horrible latencies once you go past that. Um, so that would be in, in one of the, the symptoms or the, something that you may experience. Um, I have seen that, and it could be that whenever you do your trace route from router A from your network to the other end, 
uh, you don't see any latency. But then uh, coming back when you do a trace route, you'll notice that the path is different, and then you see the latency. So the latency could only be one way as well. Um, typically, you would see that regardless, but that is typically what you would see. And is it really a BGP problem? No, it's not. It's more of a traffic engineering problem. But is it BGP related? Um, the the further comment that uh, our our listener actually says is sometimes you can get to some websites and not others. Um, that is definitely a possibility of a not necessarily BGP problem, but it could be a routing table problem. Uh, whereas, let's use this example. Uh, I I'm on a peering exchange. I have Apple, Microsoft, all these good guys on the peering exchange, and then I have a transit provider. My transit provider basically gets me to everything else. So the example is, is if I'm going to Facebook, guess what Facebook comes right up because it goes through the peering exchange. I go to Netflix, I go to Google, all these things work just fine. But whenever I try to go to mom and pop, Arsenal, Credit Union, or, or whatever it is that goes through some other uh, provider that is I'm not directly peered with, I can't get to it. That would be an example of uh, some type of traffic engineering or routing issue that is there. And it could be related to BGP, but it could also could just simply be an actual routing issue as well. Uh, it would definitely be something that you would have to use the tools that uh, we have mentioned here to determine where are we trying to go to, which path are we going to. And typically, once you get to the right person with your upstream, typically they can give you a lot of information of, you know, no, we, that goes to Hurricane, or this one goes to Cogen, or whatever, wherever it goes, they can give you a lot more information. The the other thing that I've seen uh, is uh, as BGP is asymmetrical, there is features in certain routers uh, called reverse pathing, and basically what that means is they want to see uh, symmetrical traffic through that connection. And I have seen where a provider that you are converting from a standard internet connection with no BGP to BGP forgets to turn off that uh, RP service or that RP traffic cop. And now all of a sudden any type of traffic trying to go out that provider basically either doesn't go out or doesn't come back in because you don't see both directions. And they stop that because of that. They don't they think they should. Uh, so I have seen that as well. Uh, but every particular issue, I don't think you can generalize. I think a lot of these issues are going to be related to, maybe not BGP, but related to something on their network that is either causing BGP to drop and come back up or in optimal routing, which, of course, could be your traffic engineering, which could be in BGP as well. So very, very, very good question. So... Uh, Anything else, if you have any other questions, please type it into our chat window. We will be glad to take those questions. Uh, since we are nearing our end, uh, would you like to, to wrap up and, and give us any closing comments? Um, thank you for having me today, uh, Dennis. I appreciate it. Uh, I hope uh, our little chat uh, helps out uh, folks in, uh, in clearing the understanding on BGP and uh, reduce the amount of potential fear <laughs> that may exist with something that is uh, perceived to be overly complicated or um, it, 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 at the end of the day, it's a very powerful tool which helps the service provider run its network in a much better uh, to to improve in, in, improve its network and and allow flexibility and 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 a lot less sleepless nights. It's not something to be afraid of. Excellent, excellent. Well, I do thank you for coming on the show, especially at the last minute. Uh, I was just looking for someone to to help out and, and chit chat with. It's always better than to have uh, just me talking. Uh, I do know we had some great feedback, and of course, this show will be available for download later on uh, in the day as well. Uh, once we put the uh, the package back together. Uh, I don't see any more questions, so what we'll just do is, is leave it with these final remarks. Um, you know, Once you go BGP, you won't go back to static. You, you, you sit there and go, how in the heck did I ever do my network before whenever you start going BGP? It's like, it's like going from static routes to, to OSPF. It's like, why would I ever do uh, static again? So... There's definitely really, really good things, and, and keep in mind, the Internet kind of runs on it. 
You know, uh, the internet uses BGP all over the world, so it cannot be a bad thing at all. So with that said, uh, we'll go ahead and wrap up here. Uh, if you guys have any questions, feel free to email support at ispradio.com. Or if you have any suggestions for other shows, again, send that email as well. Thank you, thank you everybody, and we hope to see you back uh, next week. Thank you for listening to ISP Radio. We hope you've gained new insights and additional wisdom in our industry as well as your business. Please remember to visit our show sponsors via the links on ISPRadio.com. If you're interested in becoming a show sponsor,